Well, thank you very much for having me, everybody. Um, just shout out if I get too close or too far away from the microphone when I'm talking, and um, a and I'm talking. Uh, I can't remember the exact title of it, but I know that revolutionary defeatism features largely in the title, um, perhaps a little less largely in the talk itself, though it does come up. Uh, um, a I'm thinking about war, I'm thinking about international relations, and I'm thinking about international boundaries, and I'm talking here. Um, with war, Engels, we know, Frederick Engels, did take a great interest in military affairs, and he is nicknamed the general. Um, he, he did know a lot about military affairs. Uh, and he wrote a lot uh, about the wars that happened, and almost always predicted um, incorrectly who would win. Um, like, so he knew quite a lot of what he was doing, but he wasn't much better than the rest of us at predicting uh, Mark, right. Mark, you've suddenly become unclear. You were clear at the beginning, unclear now. Okay. Uh, how's this? Good. Yeah, better. Is that all right? Yes, coming it's better. through. Okay. So, um, so Engels interested in war usually predicted the war the wrong winner, uh, but Marx and Engels together saw international relations as a terrain for the democratic and the proletarian movements to operate on. It wasn't something outside. These movements, it was uh, something uh, that they uh, thought should be part of the programme, should be part of the agitation. When I say the democratic and proletarian movements, just to clarify that slightly, I'm, I'm really using democratic in the earlier 19th century sense of the term, which is not just democratic demands as we had understood, understand it, but also a social movement, a popular social movement involving the petty bourgeoisie, uh, involving artisans, involving sections of the peasantry, a mass movement, not distinctly proletarian, uh, but not simply the kind of vapid uh, notion of uh, that um, a, a, a Rishi Sunak at the minute is talking about on TV. Uh, it's a social movement as well as a political programme. Um, so Marx and Engels, um, when they looked at wars, looked at international affairs, they did take sides. Um, a, they weren't neutral or pacifist, um, a, nor were they a plague on both houses. They generally took a side if a war happened. Um, usually, um, a, uh, they're on the side which was against Russia. Um, in 1848 to 49, they hoped to see a general war develop out of that revolution as a way to radicalize and consolidate the revolution. Uh, they were in favour of war against Russia and possibly against England as the counter-revolutionary powers. Um, later on, um, a, they favoured Anglo-French victory in the Crimean War, um, a, uh, though they would have preferred the theatre of operations to have been not in Crimea, but uh, against Russia in occupied Poland, therefore a war of liberation as well as an anti-Tsarist war. When it came to the American Civil War, they had no doubt at all they favoured a Northern victory in the US Civil War. Um, a, when it came to the war, and uh, sorry, I should have come before this, but the wars, um, uh, 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 the war of French forces uh, against Austria at the beginning in Italy, beginning in 1859, uh, they seem actually to have favoured an Austrian victory then. Uh, they're really opposed to the Napoleonic regime. Though as that war turned into a war of national unification and liberation, uh, they applauded that um, a, um, a, a semi-revolutionary war, in particular the contribution of Garibaldi and the Masala Thousand, which is a kind of revolutionary contribution to the war of Italian unification. In 1870, uh, Prussia and France go to war. Um, a, Marx and Engels very clearly at the outset they back Prussia and they attack the German socialists, Wilhelm Liebknecht and August Bebel, for only abstaining on, for abstain, abstaining, um, on Prussian war credits. They said they should have voted in favour of war credits. Um, however, they switched the support of France after Napoleon III is overthrown. Um, so they switched sides in that war. Um, at the time, saying that the radicals in Paris should hold off and not undermine the war against Prussia. Um, however, when a um, civil war in France does develop, nonetheless, um, a, with the emergence of the Commune and the counter-revolutionary war to suppress the Commune, they obviously take the side of the Commune. Um, 
so generally speaking, um, a, there wasn't a kind of argument coming out of Marx and Engels of any war should be revolutionary defeatist that you want to see your own side lose. Uh, they did take sides in the wars that emerged and they considered international affairs um, a, to be uh, strategic tactical questions which should be considered on merit, how they would relate to the broader democratic movement and the broader proletarian movement. Um, similarly, Marx and Engels didn't really ever put forward a general right to self national self-determination. Uh, they did eventually argue for Irish independence, and they were pretty consistent that there should be Polish independence. Uh, but they did tend to relate these as sui generis, as particular. Uh, this is not uh, coming out of a general principle of national self-determination. Um, fairly notoriously, they opposed Slavic self-determination uh, during 1848-49, seeing um, a, uh, the Slavic nationalities at the time as being more or less on the side of counter-revolution. When you get to the period of the Second International, um, it's worth emphasizing that the left parties of, of the Second International, generally speaking, took existing state boundaries as their framework. Um, in this sense, they were not, generally speaking, pro-secession, pro the breakup of states, or pro revanchist that is the coming together of um, a nationalities across uh, uh, state lines. Um, they were, in the famous words of the Cold War historian Peter Nettle, inheritor parties. Uh, Nettle had all kinds of senses what this meant, but really what it meant was uh, their aim was to build a movement, to build a party within the existing state structures and ultimately to inherit that state those state boundaries as a framework from which to begin building socialism. Um, now, it's worth, I'm, I'm talking about states rather than nation states uh, deliberately, uh, because it's worth remembering that the nation state was fairly unusual in Europe at this time, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. The United Kingdom, Austria-Hungary and the Tsar empires were all obviously multinational states. Um, Germany wasn't really a nation state. It excluded a large number of Germans who lived in Austria, uh, and it included a good number of Poles. Um, a Bismarck was very happy to exclude Austria, too many Catholics. Now, the position of the Second International was that these states did have a right of national of self-defence. Um, uh, they used the phrase national self-defence, but actually state self-defence is probably more accurate because you're not talking about nation states, as I say. During the famous debates around the, uh, the time of the Millerand affair, so when France, as socialist deputy, had joined the Bourgeois government, uh, this is debated in the French party, then debated at the International, uh, is condemned at the International, and there's the famous Kautsky resolution drawn up saying that socialists should not, as normal, uh, in the normal course of things, join uh, Bourgeois coalitions. Um, However, in the midst of those debates, there was uh, an alliance made for the possibility of an emergency coalition in certain circumstances where a socialist minister might join a bourgeois coalition in government, one which was to defend established democratic rights and, and privileges, which had been won. The other was in the situation of foreign invasion, where you might have a government of unity against foreign invasion. Uh, this clearly is going to be significant, this decision, low-key as it was, uh, but this assumption on the international was important in 1914. Generally, however, the international, in rhetorical terms, played down the right of national self-defence, um, mostly because they considered, rightly, that any generalised war would be catastrophic, and therefore the important thing was to avoid a situation where you get into war. Uh, the 1907, famous 1907 Stuttgart resolution against war and militarism is often seen as being against any war, um, at least in the circumstances of capitalism. Uh, it's not actually true. If you read the resolution in German, it refers to Angriffskrieg, which means aggressive war. They are opposed to aggressive war. Now, they don't positively state that they're in favour of defensive warfare, but the international actually is in favour of defensive warfare. Uh, and this is not something which awaits the socialist revolution. It's a right they consider to be uh, actually standing and, uh, and existent. Uh, the famous last paragraph to the Stuttgart resolution, which threatened to parlay war into revolution, 
uh, is probably best understood as a kind of cease and desist warning to the great powers. It was only really the anarchist left which pointed out that the new situation of mass uh, citizen armies and mass armaments um, a, uh, and the shading of diplomatic manoeuvres into questions of force made it really difficult to, to distinguish aggressive war, which is illegitimate, from defensive war, which is legitimate. Actually, it's very difficult, they were saying in the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, to distinguish who actually is the aggressor, who is the defender when war breaks out. Uh, it's not actually new. Um, a Bismarck in 1870, famously through a diplomatic manoeuvre with the Ems Telegram, had managed to present Prussia as uh, France as being the aggressor, when in fact Prussia wanted a war in 1870. Uh, most people were conned by the Ems Telegram. Uh, so was Marx, actually. He was conned by it. Um, and this is a standard fog of war thing that usually it's very difficult to know in the run-up to war and the outbreak of war exactly who's doing what and who's conniving at what and who's the aggressor and who's the defender uh, because strategies of war is all about deception. Um, a, we're likely to forget this because Israel seems to have lost the ability to do, to do good propaganda, but generally speaking, belligerents are good at propaganda, particularly in the run-up to war. More fundamentally, in the early 20th century, because of the new requirement of mass armies, um, everybody knew that if general war broke out, there'd be very congested lines of march, there'd be huge sprawling front lines, um, and that there'd be a real requirement in order to avoid bogging down into attritional warfare to get your attack in first. That is, the best form of defence is attack. Um, a particular if you want to avoid getting uh, bogged down into war of attrition. And in fact, it's an old argument, it's still a good one. AJP Taylor made the argument in 1914 that this is a war by timetable, that once war became a real possibility, then the incentive for all the belligerent powers was to get war processes, mobilization processes operating, because what you had to do is to move everybody by schedule, by, by train timetable, if they were to get to the right place at the right time, if you miss your schedule, you, you miss the ability to mobilize in such a way that you can hopefully get a war winning blow in first. So the reality in 1914 is that if you want to win that war, you have to get your strike in as quickly as you can. In that sense, from a strategic or planning point of view, talking about aggressor defender doesn't make a lot of uh, sense. Now, historiography, historians now generally pretty universally blame the Germans for 1914, or it could Christopher Clark, you blame the Austrians. Uh, some people blame the Russians, but generally it's the Germans people blame. Really, 1914 is a war to protect alliances before they fall apart. Germany goes to war um, in order to protect the alliance with Austria. If they don't go to war in 1914, there's no alliance with Austria anymore and they're in a, uh, a strategically weakened situation. France really goes to war to protect the alliance with Russia. If Russia goes down without French help, then the alliance is gone. Um, really, the great powers go to war and they attack in 1914 because they fear if they don't do it then, they're going to have to fight a war in worse circumstances in years to come. So really, the anarchists had a point when they said, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, that distinguishing between um, defensive war, uh, aggressive war, and defensive war is kind of unreal, you know. And fundamentally, this is the position that Lenin adopts in 1914. Um, he does so by theorizing um, a new stage in capitalism, which is the stage of imperialism. And he argues that the imperialist stage of capitalism, and I can elaborate upon this in the discussion if you like, um, basically makes both national self-defense and indeed regular parliamentary electoral politics a thing of the past. So when he argues that uh, it's impossible to distinguish between legitimate defensive war, illegitimate uh, aggressive war in 1914, this marks a period when a generalized period of bourgeois, um, a, a, a desire to maintain regular state regula uh, international uh, a, uh, regularities has fallen apart, that the bourgeoisie has become both um, a 
uh, if you like, instinctively aggressive um, because of the demands of imperialism and instinctively anti-democratic, anti-parliamentary, anti-electoralism. So really 1914 for Lenin uh, marks the point when you can no longer distinguish between aggressive and defensive wars when it comes to great powers. And you can no longer rely upon um, a, um, uh, a general prolonged period of orderly domestic politics based around parliamentarianism. Um, so 1914 for Lenin is the end of that kind of politics which had allowed the second international strategy of patience, as it's known, or strategy of attrition. The second international had based its politics on a strategy of patience, that is building the party, building the movement, the trade unions, the cooperative, the press, um, the electoral fraction, the party itself, building generally and, and bit by bit, uh, because you've got the space to do so, because of a prolonged period of peace, and a prolonged period of general civil and political liberty to a greater or lesser extent. Lenin argues in 1914, all that's come to an end. So Lenin shifts from a strategy of um, patience to a strategy of overthrow. And he says, the reason you need to do this is because the bourgeoisie have equally given up on peace and electoralism. So rather now it is um, a Lenin puts it as it's either um, imperialist war or social war. And what he means by social war is um, social revolution in the form of violent struggles for power. Uh, Lenin drew this partly from Kautsky's um, Hill Ferdings, uh, for, from Hill Ferdings finance capital. Uh, Kautsky himself had seen the implications of Hill Ferdings finance capital in a way that Hill Ferding hadn't seen. Uh, the implication of um, Hill Ferding's finance capital is that indeed the political space for the strategy of attrition, the strategy of patience is coming to an end. Uh, Kautsky doesn't like that consequence, which is why he comes up with a broad theory of ultra imperialism as an alternative or a sequel to Hill Ferding's finance capital notion of imperialism. Um, obviously, Lenin rejects ultra imperialism and says that the, the, uh, the epoch of peaceful development has come to an end with capitalism. Now, there was an odd contradiction in Lenin's position. On the one hand, he was saying, at least for the great powers, that national defence was out. You can no longer talk about that. However, he also said, he also defended national self-determination. Now, it's difficult to see how you have national self-determination without national defence, uh, because national defence is a mode of asserting national self-determination. And in fact, the Bikar and Piatikov group within the Bolshevik Party pointed this out and said Lenin's support for national self-determination made nonsense of his arguments against national self-defense. And therefore, they, were, they opposed the slogan of national self-determination. Lenin's response was, first of all, to differentiate between the nationalism of the oppressor nation and the nationalism of the oppressed nation. The oppressed nation gets self, uh, national self-determination. The oppressed or, oppressor nation doesn't have that right. It's a bit of a cop-out, really, though, because if by definition your self-determination is being challenged or denied, then you are being oppressed. Um, so I'm not really sure that argument works. Second and more fundamentally, he did, in fact, make this Bolshevik kind of argument for the right of national self-determination conditional. So as he wrote on uh, when he in the thesis in Brest-Litovsk, Lenin wrote, no Marxist without renouncing the principles of Marxism and of socialism generally can deny that the interests of socialism are higher than the interest of nations to self-determination. Uh, and he said this you know, shortly before Russia is invading Poland and then invading Georgia. Uh, the thing about right, though, is a right is not conditional in this way. Um, so really, Lenin does, in practice, become quite close to saying that the right of national self-determination isn't a right. Um, a... Now, despite Lenin's groundings of all his political positions that he tends to take in terms of grand theory, I think it's often better to think of Lenin's position as evolving out of the exigencies of the political tasks which confronted him and his party. Now, the strategy of patience, which I've alluded to, this kind of Kautskyan strategy, which is broadly acceptable in the Second International, of building the party, building the press, building the 
organs of uh, proletarian self-determination. Um, this strategy of patience um, had been adopted by the Second International. Um, Lenin accepted that accepted it too until 1914. But in Russia, it always went paradoxically hand in hand with, with a strategy of overthrow. However, that was overthrowing the czarist regime. The strategy of patience was a perspective of building up proletarian capacities for assuming um, a uh, its role as a, as a ruling class in society through building up its press, trade unions, cooperatives and party. The strategy of overthrow, however, was a much more immediate confrontational approach. And importantly, it was a class collaborationist perspective. That is, it assumed either an alliance with the liberal bourgeoisie to overthrow czarism, the Menshevik perspective, or an alliance of the peasantry to overthrow czarism, the Bolshevik perspective. So the development of the Leninist slogan of the right of national self-determination, I think, should be seen within this context. It is an explicit appeal to the nationalist petty bourgeoisie in the first instance to collaborate in the overthrowing of czarism. You help overthrow czarism, we support your right of national self-determination. Uh, it needs to be remembered that the Finns and even more the Poles were absolutely in the vanguard of the, the revolution against czarism in 1905. They were not a reserve, they were a vanguard in that revolutionary process. Uh, now this carried over to 1917 because in part actually the Leninist schema envisaged the, the, the revolution as a kind of bourgeois revolution without the bourgeoisie. The idea was it would be a revolution to create a state of worker peasantry class alliance that in turn would force march a mode of capitalism towards the direction of socialism. In 1917-18, uh, Lenin describes this mode of capitalism um, a, under the direction of a proletarian peasant state as state capitalism, weird kind of capitalism, still capitalism. This is interrupted by war communism. Uh, war communism isn't a mode of capitalism, uh, nor is it really a mode of socialist construction. It's a mode of emergency, um, a um, kind of a, a military maintenance uh, at a time of um, a massive social, economic, and military crisis. Uh, war communism is replaced in turn really to a reversion to the idea of a proletarian peasant state overseeing um, a, a, a mode of state capitalism which has been forced march in the socialist direction. In 1921, it's called the New Economic Policy. Uh, it seems likely that Lenin did see that as a long-term process, not as a temporary um a um, measure. Now, in all of this, um, a the notion of class alliance is important for the Menshevik to say it's a class alliance of the proletariat and the um, a, a the uh, the liberal bourgeoisie to establish uh, a liberal, preferably very liberal bourgeois state, um, a out of which the proletarian struggle can develop. Um, a, the Leninist position is rather more complicated. There it's an alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry in order to establish a non-bourgeois state overseeing um, a, a particular form of capitalist economy, which would be forced marched towards uh, the construction of socialism. Um, and all of this really, nationalists are seen as a kind of revolutionary auxiliary. Um, a, um, and in the end, except rhetorically, once the right of self-determination could no longer be instrumentalized as a weapon against the czarist state and thereafter the successor uh, a kind of um, a, a temporary kind of um, state of the provisional government, um, uh, beyond that, the, 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 when you could no longer instrumentalize the right of self-determination, it becomes otherwise than rhetorical. Um, a really not an important part of Bolshevik strategy. It doesn't feature when Soviet Union invades Poland, doesn't feature when they invade Georgia, it's ignored. Um, now, Lenin's position in favor of the right of national self-determination, it's worth emphasizing, is unusual, you know. Um, more typical, I think, of the Second International, 
uh, the second international uh, in the period of strategy of patients was the Austro-Marxist position. Now, the Austro-Marxists in Austria-Hungary were absolutely, absolutely confronted with the national question. There were like the multiple nationalities within that empire. Uh, unlike uh, the situation with Tsarist Russia, they did not see the Austro-Hungarian Empire as a kind of behemoth uh, that needed to be disaggregated, that needed to be pulled apart. If anything, the disintegration of the Austro-Hungarian state entity, they saw as um, significantly threatening for the stability of Europe, that part of Europe, that in effect, if Austria-Hungary were to fall apart, what that would mean would be the de facto partition of the entire that entire region of Europe into a German bloc and a Russian bloc, pan-Germanism and pan-Slavism uh, would dominate that period. Um, a, and this is the general feeling that unless the nationalities of Austria-Hungary hang together, they'll hang separately under the domination of Russian or German domination. And actually, this is broadly accepted within Austria-Hungary. There are very loud, noisy, vociferous, angry, uh, pretty middle-class nationalist movements in Austria-Hungary, amongst the Czechs in particular, up to 1914. But in general, they weren't separatist, because they had a feeling that if you disaggregate the Austro-Hungarian Empire into small, many states, they'll simply fall under the control of either Germany or Russia. So the Austro-Marxist position on the national question was not the right of national self-determination, but rather the argument, the right for cultural autonomy within the state. Um, this is developed famously by Karl Renner, um, who's a terrible guy, Otto Bauer, more impressive kind of guy, they developed the theory. Um, and ultimately, what they're arguing is about charting a democratic process of negotiating national claims, really with a function, they hope, of clearing space for class politics to develop. The way Otto Bauer put it was, national autonomy is not a program devised by clever men in order to rescue the state in its hour of need, but the demand that the proletariat necessarily voices in the multinational state. National autonomy is a necessary goal for the proletarian class struggle because it is a necessary means of its class politics. Uh, so there's kind of no sense of a priority of national right here. It's more or less a democratic program that you put forward in order to take the steam out of the national question as much as possible in order to allow the prioritization of class politics. It must be said it's reasonably successful, partly because nationalist politics are not that popular with the proletariat. Uh, it's much more middle class or petty, petty bourgeois thing before 1914. Um, a, um, and in fact, the socialists in Austria-Hungary Austria do develop a pretty good broad base amongst, say, both German and Czechs. Um, nonetheless, it's not complete. Um, a, and indeed, I think 1912, you have the breakaway of the Czech Socialist Party. Now, another approach uh, was uh, saying, well, actually, nationalism can be allied to the socialist program. Uh, I can talk about this a bit more uh, later on in the discussion, perhaps. I'm not going to do it much now. Obvious Irish example is James Connolly. Um, a, uh, uh, he's got the main train station in Dublin named after him. Pretty sure it's the only train station in Europe named after a Marxist. So there is that, you know. Um, a, he does participate in the 1916 rebellion, uh, pretty much under the flag of nationalism. It's not very obvious. There's no socialist element in 1916, really, you know. But his argument had been that you can combine national liberation with socialist revolution. Um, a other person who makes this argument is Joseph Pilsudski in um, Poland. Uh, he more or less straightforwardly ends up as a nationalist dictator, an anti-socialist nationalist dictator. Rosa Luxemburg famously stopped the Second International by tilting at one of its sacred cows, um, really a kind of left liberal shibboleth, which had been inherited from the early uh, 19th century. That is the independence of Poland, or at least the independence of that part of Poland under Russian occupation. Uh, Luxembourg denied that there was any right to national self-determination. Um, um, she makes bad arguments. She makes some good arguments that when you have a right of national self-determination, it's difficult to see how you avoid a situation where you don't give prior right 
to a pan-class nation over mere class demands of the proletariat. Okay, um, we come now a little bit to um, what you've all been waiting for at basic breath, which is revolutionary defeatism. Um, now, Lenin's position, as I've argued vis-a-vis -vis the Tsarist Empire, was overthrow rather than patiently waiting as an inheritor party to inherit the state. Disaggregating the state, losing Poland, losing um, a Finland, losing all sorts, was worth it to overthrow Tsarism. Um, a, so there wasn't an intention to democratize the czarist multinational state. The intention was to kind of break it apart. Um, he actually wasn't alone in this kind of um, a radical attitude. It's pretty much what most liberals think in the czarist empire. And indeed, when it comes to war in 1904, 1905, the, the Russo-Polish War, um, the Bolsheviks are revolutionary defeatist. So are the Mensheviks. So are the liberals, actually. Um, fundamentally, liberals, virtually as much as socialists, want to see Russia defeated in that war because that will help the overthrow of the czarist regime. And also, they don't care that much. You know, it's it's interests thousands of miles away in the Far East. They don't really care. they don't think there's anything important at stake in that war. And they're quite happy to see czarism militarily defeated. But that means the overthrow of czarism. So 1904, 1905, 1906, revolution of defeatism is really a liberal left common sense. Um, it's a, um, and it nearly works actually, the, the Russian Japanese War, Russian defeats, does spark a revolution back in the, um, the Russian heartland, which comes quite close to overthrowing Tsarism in 1905. Now to get to the Great War in 1914, it's a bit more complicated. Um, even then, however, by about 1916, um, liberals and indeed quite substantial elements of the right wing in Russia are beginning to at least quietly welcome defeats on the front if it means you get rid of the decrepit czarist regime because they see the czarist regime as being fundamentally that bad, you know. So defeats at the front, um, if, if it means an overthrow of czarism is acceptable to the liberals, certainly acceptable to the socialists, even acceptable to elements of the right. Uh, because the Caesarism is just completely hopeless for this point. Obviously, it's more complicated after the February Revolution, when Tsarism is overthrown. Then the liberal left want military victories, because that will bolster the provisional government. Um, the Bolsheviks understood reasonably enough, and they weren't alone in this, that immediate military victories would only bolster the army, which in turn would mean the army would... Uh, would a uh, mounted military coup, uh, which had overthrow um, a the, uh, um, the relatively liberal regime and establish an, an authoritarianism in alliance with Britain and France. Um, that's what they argue. Um, so the Bolsheviks are saying are, are revolutionary defeatists to the extent that they don't want military victories until the provisional government is pushed out of the way. Uh, but they're not, they're not absolutist, revolutionary defeatists. Um, part of the argument the Bolsheviks make for overthrowing the provisional government is that actually they argue the provisional government is itself defeatist, that they argue that the provisional government will be willing, for example, to hand um, Petrograd, uh, the capital of the country, over to the Germans if that, if that means that it'll crush the left-wing challenge to the provisional government. Uh, maybe some element of truth to that, but it's certainly an argument the Bolsheviks use. And so, in fact, they argue for Soviet power partly on the basis to avoid defeatist elements within the provisional government or to displace defeatist elements within the provisional government. The argument of the Bolsheviks is that if you have a Soviet government, first of all, the revolution might bring about, bring about a general upsurge which will lead, in short order, to a general peace across Europe. If that doesn't happen, then it may be possible to negotiate an acceptable unilateral peace with the Germans. If that's not available, then the next position is revolutionary warfare. So it's by no means straightforward that, you know, revolutionary defeatism is not a straightforward position here. Um, the general assumption is that if there's no immediate general peace conference, 
if the Germans don't offer reasonable um, conditions for a ceasefire uh, or, or for a prolonged um, a cessation of hostilities, uh, then there'll be revolutionary war against the Germans. And this, after all, is why Brest Litovsk, the actual treaty with Germany, is so problematic. Most Bolsheviks, um, most uh, left SRs, prefer the idea of revolutionary warfare to sucking up to Brest Litovsk. Um, Brest Litovsk, interesting, by the way, because actually Russia gives away not much territory, which isn't actually, you know, not Russian, um, uh, which is actually Russian. I mean, they don't give away territory, which is Russian. Um, what they don't accept is the right of self-determination being dictated by Germany, uh, the right of national self-determination being dictated by Germany. But anyway, Brest Litovsk is widely unacceptable if conditions which are likely to be signed away at Brest Litovsk is widely uh, unconditional. Uh, and Lenin basically forces the issue by saying, I'm going to break the party, I'm going to split the party, go to split the government, uh, unless you accept whatever the Germans are prepared to offer at Brest Litovsk. Um, uh, what Lenin is looking for is a breathing space. Um, obviously, you can debate hypotheticals. I think it's a major mistake, actually, by Lenin and the Bolsheviks, and I think Lenin half admits this. You know, First of all, there is no breathing space. Brest Litovsk pretty much immediately kicks off a civil war, which is much worse than it might have been, because so many people think that the Bolsheviks have be betrayed the essential interests of um, a, the Russian people and the Russian state. Um, they alienate a broad section of leftists who are sympathetic um, a, uh, to Soviet power, um, a, and, um, and they don't get any breathing space anyway, because in fact, you know, civil war breaks out almost immediately. Um, I think it would have been much better, actually, to have fought a revolutionary war of defence, which certainly would have meant continual retreat for a prolonged basis. But in fact, there's only so far the Germans want to go. They want to get forces back to the Western Front. And anyway, we're about to lose the war, uh, as it turns out. Um, so I think in practice, actually, it would be much better for the Bolsheviks to take the line of Bukharin or the line of Trotsky, uh, not the line of Lenin. Anyway, towards the end of the war, um, the right of national self-determination becomes a big thing, kind of a fetishized thing, um, partly because... Um, a Lenin has been talking about the right of national self-determination, as we know, um, a, and partly because of the appeal it has. Uh, a Woodrow Wilson, the American president, picks it up, um, and famously the 14 points asserts the right of national self-determination. In fact, they don't, you know. His 14 points for uh, on which the war might be ended don't actually assert a right of self-determination. All it asserts is um, a um, defeated powers like Austria-Hungary are going to be divided up into constituent nation states. It's rather a right of self-determination if it breaks up the enemy. And that, in fact, is usually how the right of self-determination uh, uh, has ever been applied in international relations. Um, a, but it becomes a bit fetishized, the right of national self-determination thereafter. Now, I want to point to some of the difficulties to the right of national self-determination. First of all, what's a nation? Uh, there's a famous definition, which in many respects is not a bad uh, definition, uh, which, uh, which Stalin puts together uh, under the direction of Lenin in, in a polemic uh, about the national question. Stalin says, a nation is a historically constituted, stable community of people Founded on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup, manifested in a common culture. It's not wrong, but it's very wise. You know, um, a, some of you will have heard of them: the British and Irish Communist Organisation, or BICO, as we used to for, uh, fondly call them, um, a, which was a kind of Maoist and then post-Maoist organisation uh, in in Ireland, um, who developed in the early 1970s uh, the theory of two nations, that Ireland is two nations. Um, as they put it in June 1973, the partition of Ireland was the outcome of the growth of two distinct Irish nations, each with its own economic life and culture, its own religion and view of history, and each with its own closely knit identity. Um, you probably uh, can hear the echoes of Stalin's formulation of a nation there. It's difficult to see how the Protestant community in the north of Ireland 
uh, are not in Stalinist terms a nation, and therefore, by logic, have right of self-determination. Uh, and that's the conclusion Bible draws. Uh, Northern Ireland is two nations, Protestants of Ulster, ergo Northern Ireland, had right of self-determination, partition is grand. So there is a difficulty of how do you define your nation? Um, there's the other difficulty, which is a practical um, a, a question of political international relations. Um, the right of nation, the right of self-determination is an open door to foreign subversion. It's worth bearing in mind that the main um, arrow of um, American CIA and so on subversion against the Soviet Union was, um, they always recognised this, was you prize a part at, nas at the national question. The national question is the weak point of the Soviet Union. Um, a, uh, and I raise this, you know, not as a particular defence of Stalinist, uh, Stalinized um, Soviet bloc, but rather to make the point that actually, yes, the right of national self-determination is very skillfully employed um, a, as a way by foreign powers to intervene and to subvert an enemy power. Further point, self-determination is very often, uh, national self-determination is very often, and in fact, usually strongest the, um, the, the drive towards it, uh, not amongst the oppressed um, a peoples, but actually those who got a certain amount of wealth and privilege who want to escape um, from the requirements of um, a being within um, a, a broader state structure. Um, they feel they're rich and they want to go off and be independent. There's an element of this with historic Scottish nationalism, Scottish oil. Why are we, why are we being dragged back by England? You can certainly see it in Northern Italy, the Norda Liga, uh, which is ultra-right-wing regionalist party, which is often raising the threat of North Italian self-determination. North Italy does have its own identity in many respects. Fundamentally, it's richer than the South. And the argument of we have a right to national self-determination is an argument of, um, of a disdain for the poor South. Um, it may be an element of that about uh, Catalonia. I'm not sure about that, but it's um, a, I don't know Catalonian situation well enough, but Catalonia is certainly better off than a lot of the rest of Spain. Uh, it's fundamentally and massively, overwhelmingly the case if you look at the Confederacy um, in the American Civil War. Uh, the Confederate States clearly had an identity, clearly had a, an identity. Um, a, they claimed that they were a nation of sorts. Um, a, they're also, it's also a rebellion of slave owners, um, even leaving aside slavery. Uh, if you look at the army of North Virginia, the average soldier is about six times richer than the army of the Union Army, uh, the Union armies they're confronting across the battlefield. This is a slaveholder's rebellion using the argument of self-determination. American Civil War is an interesting case. Um, the South said that they had a legal um, right to secede from the Union, which couldn't be impeached. They said the Union was voluntary, therefore leaving the Union is equally voluntary. Now, the North denied this. The North's argument was when you join the Union, you're not allowed to leave it um, a, legally. You can't just leave it. Uh, the Union is a one-way process. When you've joined it, you joined it. There's no back door. You can just leave it again. Now, the North said there is, however, a right to revolution. Now, the right to revolution is to break whatever implied or explicit contract there may be, uh, to break that contract, to break away from it violently if need be, on the basis of a moral right to revolution. So there isn't an automatic right of secession. Um, a, there's a right of revolution. This is what the North said in the American Civil War. But the right of revolution is always a necessarily a moral right. A right of revolution must have a moral basis. If you are breaking away in order to defend slavery, by definition, your moral right to revolution falls. And you have no backup automatic right of self-determination. There is no right of self-determination. There's a right to revolution or you remain part of a wider democratic polity. That's the argument the North makes during the American Civil War. That's why they don't recognize the self-determination of the Southern states. That's why they wage a war to suppress it. That's arguably, that's also why uh, 
Marks and Angles supported the North. So it gets to general question. In my view, the national question is a distributional question at the level of culture. Um, a uh, Like all distributional questions, the socialist perspective is dual. On the one hand, socialists, when it comes to questions of distribution, they look to the immediate and medium term interests of the working class. Um, they do that with an important qualification. They don't ignore the interests of other important classes, historically pe the peasantry, today the petty bourgeoisie. So it's not only the proletariat that you look to in immediate um, in questions of distribution, uh, but in bulk's largest force are socialists. In the longer run, socialists want to see distribution being decided by, from each according to her ability, to each according to her needs, which can only be accommodated by a negotiated process of planning when it comes to distribution. Uh, a negotiated process which is iterative. It's not a one-off decision. It's an ongoing decision. How do, you, how do you determine what people need? How do you determine what, what, what people can contribute? This is a process which is done through a planning process, which is at each stage negotiated through radical democracy. Okay, So distribution um, is something which socialists argue is something which should be um, not subordinated to parliament, uh, sorry, not subordinated to parliament, not subordinated to abstract rights, but rather subordinated to a radical, democratic, iterative process of negotiation. Now, unlike material resources, which can be grown over time so everybody can get richer, cultural rights are tricky because they tend to be zero sum. Take the example of Northern Ireland. Insofar as Northern Ireland becomes more Irish, it becomes less British and vice versa. Uh, so not always, but there's a tendency for cultural rights to be zero sum. One side to win, the other side has to lose. Um, this is tricky. It makes it makes the question more difficult. Nonetheless, I think the socialist position when it comes to national cultural questions should remain uh, a position of favouring radical democratic process, not laggard community rights, which are non-negotiable. Now, the democratic process can agree to secession, can agree to a people seceding, forming a new state. Um, a, to some extent, actually, this did apply, at least formally, to Scotland, where there was a negotiated process. Scotland was, it was agreed that Scotland could have a referendum to decide whether it would become independent or not. But now the question remains in, in abeyance uh, because the um, uh, uh, the UK state says um, not, not ruling out a future referendum in this question, but they're not allowing it now, you know. Um, a, uh, uh, but I don't think socialists need to feel themselves committed to this idea that any nation so defined has a right of self-determination as a priori, which trumps all other democratic questions of process. In the end, and to put it bluntly, any socialist state should retain the right to suppress insurrection, even if that insurrection is appealing to a right of national self-determination in particular because subversion of a socialist state is almost certainly going to be, utilize and to work upon and to finance um, a, a national, a, a quasi, a regional, a national minority as a way to uh, weaken a socialist state. That's what the Americans did against the communist bloc. It's certainly what an opposed bloc would do to a socialist state or a socialist bloc of states. Um, I think the socialist argument is a right of democratic process, um, which may end up with an agreed process of um, secession, but not an a priori right for secession. Now, a right of democratic process does not thereby um, vacate the right of democratic revolution. Um, a, or, sorry, the right, uh, the, the moral right of revolution. Um, a nation may have a right of revolution, but these things are not defined by ticking a checkbox of you know, Stalin's rules about what defines a nation. Rather, a democratic right of revolution is itself conditioned 
and conditional on its moral basis. And the moral basis is something which is derived from a complex and ultimately political analysis of any situation. So the premise of international relations, I think, actually, as it stands, is that state boundaries may indeed be changed, but only by negotiated iterative force. I would argue there's also a right of moral revolution, as here defined. You know, uh, it's not an abstract general right of any nation uh, to self-determination, but rather a particular moral right uh, of a, um, a national people who are otherwise denied the fundamentals of democratic self-expression, that then allows them a right of a moral right of revolution. Uh, but I'm arguing that's distinct from a right of self-determination as such. Um, so when you talk about international boundaries, they may be changed by agreement, um, a, but in international law at the minute, they cannot be changed by for by external aggression or indeed, um, a, though less obviously, they can't be changed by um, a foreign subversion. Um, a, and this is something just kind of important. Uh, you know, let's look at the 1930s. You know, what are the national questions? Who are the people looking for self, the rights of national self-determination in the 1930s? Well, one important group are the Sudeten Germans in Czechoslovakia, who unquestionably are a national group who are unquestionably denied national self-determination. Um, their rights are used as an argument and excuse by Germany and Britain to dismember Czechoslovakia with disastrous consequences. If you look at the German invasion of Poland, they make arguments at the time that the Germans within Poland, the Polish corridor, are being oppressed, are being denied national rights. Uh, this is true. Um, they also make the argument that many thousands of um, Germans within Poland and the Polish corridor are, mur are massacred uh, by yeah. Polish nationalists at the time of invasion. This is true. Um, but the overall the wider argument is that these arguments of self-determination are being used to violate, violate state sovereignty by expansionist German imperialism with disastrous consequences. And of course, the oppression and the violence and indeed the massacres of Germans within Poland are being immediately and massively dwarfed by the violence, massacres, yeah. murder and genocide of German imperialism. So I think po uh, socialists oppose the violent violation of state sovereignty by foreign state act actors, whether directly by invasion or indirectly by colour revolutions um, being financed um, in an ultra undemocratic way by uh, CIA money or whatever it happens to be. Um, a, uh, I mean, you know, particular forms of color revolution, which are encouraging regional secessionist movements. So the line is socialist, and it's not so difficult actually from formal international law, which is that you can't just change the boundaries uh, a, of a state by force, violence, or subversion. Therefore, for example, um, I think socialists accept the legal position that the occupied territories are illegitimate Israeli entities, regardless of how much time has passed and regardless of any changes, uh, any ethnic changes since they were seized. Um, and you can't create um, a new right of national self-determination by creating um, a new national peoples. Uh, let's take an example. Let's say the north of the Gaza Strip is about to be denuded of Palestinians by massacre, starvation, and expulsion. Uh, seems quite plausible. Let's say that it is then settled by the Israelis. Quite plausible. This does not create a new right of self-determination for the now dominant settled community in northern Gaza, if that happens, because it's based upon the violation of a um, internationally recognized state boundaries, um, a... Um, uh, and a right of national self-determination does not trump that. Similarly, I would argue, socialists should not and do not dissociate from the position of most states in the world, which at the minute just about still includes the US and the UK, that Taiwan does not actually have the right of self-determination as a sovereign state. Because Taiwan, as it exists now, was in practice a secession state 
established by an elite, defeated in the Civil War in the mainland, with the backup of external actors, the United States principally, seeking to reverse that revolution. Now, this is not to say that facts on the ground are never subject to this iterative process of democratic um, a negotiation, which I talked about earlier. Socialists, for example, will always be extremely cautious about violent revanchism, that is, reversion to old state boundaries, re uh, a, um, a, um, the, re the reversal of um, foreign-sponsored conquest or foreign-sponsored secession, because such actions in turn, of course, can themselves be instrumentalized by other foreign state actors or indeed by domestic authoritarians. So, for example, socialists would oppose any attempt by China to invade Taiwan. Um, I would see actually the current dispensation, one country, two governments, as a tolerable installment of a long term democratic process of sorting out that situation between between Taiwan and um, a, um, a Chinese mainland. Regarding Ukraine, I don't have the expertise to pronounce, so take caveats with all of this, uh, but certain things can be said. Ukrainian nationalism is of relatively recent growth, but certainly it's now real enough. Orders of the Ukrainian state were fairly arbitrary, that's true. Uh, quite glaringly in the case of Crimea, uh, credibly enough arbitrary when you talk about the Russian-speaking Donbass region. Um, a, it's doubtful, however, that there is any moral revolution case for secessionist national national revolution in Crimea or even or even in the Donbass. Partly, I think, and it can come back to the kind of moral status of national revolution. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. If you don't have a secession without massive foreign intervention and help. It's pretty unlikely there is a moral revolutionary case for that happening. Uh, instead, uh, Crimean secession, then the Donbass secession, uh, is clearly a Putin's regime-sponsored subversion and then violent redrawing of the, of the borders, naked aggression. This is not to say that socialists should take an absolute disposition of backing overwhelming force to restore the status quo ante. Um, they don't recognize the legitimacy of Russian conquests. Um, but they do favour a democratic resolution of the conflict, democracy as process, which might well result in an agreed shift of the border at some future point. Um, I'm not saying where or when, as I'm no expert on it, but that seems plaus plausible to me. And socialists will expose and warn against the US and its outriders, waging a proxy war of encirclement against China as a geopolitical rival, by involving itself in this particular localized uh, question of national self-determination. To take my own country and its history, I think there's no question that Ireland had a moral right to revolution, um, not a right of self-determination as a nation simply, but a moral right to revolution um, a, because of a long, a long history, uh, which we, we can go into. Um, I don't feel much difficulty in saying that because actually it's recognised by such legal eminences as A.V. Dicey, a name uh, Mike Monero recognise if, he, uh, if he's here. Uh, Dicey, who was a unionist, he argued against Home Rule, did actually recognise that there was a moral right to Irish national revolution in Ireland because of the history, because of the nature of what uh, of the state there. He was simply opposed to that revolution rewrite being actualized because in his uh, a, a mind, it went too far against the potential interests of the British state. However, if you look at um, a uh, Protestants in Ulster, um, it's very difficult not to agree with Baiko that there exists a historically constituted stable community of people formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture, Stalin's definition of a nation. Why does that not apply to the long-standing uh, Protestant community of Ulster? Uh, nonetheless, I don't think that a right of self-determination derived from the existence of the Protestant community in Ulster. Partition, after all, was first raised um, by um, not us unionists, actually, but British politicians, uh, as an attempt to frustrate the democratic process of negotiating the national question 
within Ireland and within the United Kingdom. Actually, support for unionist uh, for Ulster rebellion um, a uh, against home rule, a limited self determination in Ireland, um, was supported and was motivated by the British Tory establishment as a revolt against a broader democratization of the British constitution, uh, notably a, a limiting of the rights of the House of Lords to suppress legislation. Uh, and at the time, 1912, 1914, most people thought that the House of Lords is going to be abolished fairly quickly. And the Tories were rebelling against this and were instrumentalizing self-determination in Ulster as a way to sabotage a wider democratic de democratizing process. Moreover, Ulster Unionism, to a large extent, was based upon an ethno-religious supremacism. Um, uh, having said that, at some point, I think partition becomes baked in as, a, as an inevitability short of a civil war. Uh, I have a feeling that a, 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 an appropriate socialist approach would have been to favour maximise, maximisation of all Ireland dimensions in opposition to the, the absolute state builders on both sides of the border. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that the free states south of the border agreed to the abandonment of the Council of Ireland, which was that level of cross-partition integration, which still existed even after 1921. Now, in the, in the end, of course, a low-level war does erupt in the north from about 1971. Uh, I think an IRA victory was always virtually impossible, given the balance of forces, uh, actually certainly impossible, given the balance of forces, and, and would have been disastrous had it come about with some kind of magical um, a, a turn of events. Significance of the Good Friday Agreement as a democratic process arrangement uh, is as a democratic process arrangement on the one hand, um, a uh, limited and you know, with all the limitations which attach to it. Uh, also, interestingly, the Good Friday Agreement rejects the proposition that. Um, uh, I'm, uh, asking me to finish. Hello. Hello. Please ignore. Just go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead. I'm I'm nearly done here. I'm nearly done. Um, a sorry, I thought I was yapping on too long. You're trying to get me to stop, and which is a, indeed a good idea. Um, it's so where am I? Yeah. Um, what's significant about the Good Friday Agreement actually is that it says, um, a what it rules out implicitly is a repartition of of Ireland on the basis, let's say, of a more homogenous unionist four county Northern Ireland. That is, it's rejecting the argument of a new right of self-determination within Ireland. Rather, um, a, a, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the, way, uh, the proposal is that when, when and if there's a majority in Northern Ireland for United Ireland, that's what happens. And that strikes me uh, uh, as reasonable, rather than moving into a new right of self-determination, uh, turn of the screw. Finally, and the last point is to talk about, and this is something I didn't mention explicitly, but all, all would have been in your mind, which is the question of what socialists are to do in regards to budgets for war making. Um, uh, I'm dispensing with the euphemism of um, a, a defence, I mean, uh, a money for armies, money for the military is money for making war. You know, uh, occasionally it's defence, and very often isn't defence. You know. Um, a, so what would be the socialist position on that? Clearly, it's voting for war budgets in 1914, which breaks apart um, a, the Second International. Um, it's not a straightforward question because the provision of war material itself, uh, it, uh, the provision of war material is not in itself any, any more an instrument of foreign intervention or even aggression than the denial of the provision of war material. Both can be equally predatory. Um, so, for example, uh, it's a predatory act by Britain and um, France in its own way to cut off arms supplies from the Spanish Republic during the Spanish Civil War. It's part of international relations. It's to allow the Spanish Civil War to go under uh, because then you're choking off the possibility of an awkward leftist regime and you're cozying up to the uh, uh, the fascist powers of, of Germany and uh, Italy. So it's quite possible to be predatory, hostile, malign, whatever, by not mobilizing military resources. So it's not simply a question of you're always in favor of the pacifist line, you know. Uh, 
the other obvious point is that some wars are easy to oppose, some are less easy to oppose. Ukraine has a right to defend itself regardless of NATO shenanigans, um, though I'd have thought that a socialist party in situ would be less than happy clappy about forever war, but nonetheless, right to de self-defense is not an unreasonable thing to say. Uh, to take another war, um, I think it's probably uncontroversial that we're all glad that Germany lost the Second World War. Um, and indeed, it would have been a good thing had Hitler been stopped far in advance of 1945. But this, I would argue, doesn't resolve the issue of voting war credits. Because in the end, war credits, voting for a military budget, is fundamentally a question of confidence in a bourgeois regime or a regime uh, of which we as socialists are necessarily on the outside. A good way to think about it is in light of the 18th century mutiny bill, as it used to be known in England. Uh, the mutiny bill was a part of the conquest of the Glorious Revolution. Uh, it's something that's had to be voted on every year. It's about military discipline. In essence, it's a military budget. Um, and what it's designed to do is to stop um, a... Um, the, the Crown having its own standing army. It had to be voted for every year so you get parliamentary oversight. But of course, voting in favour of the mutiny bill is a way of voting confidence in the government of the day. If you don't get the mutiny bill passed as a government, you necessarily fall. And this, I think, still applies. A military budget is always, uh, always comes down to a vote of confidence. To vote for a military budget is to vote for uh, confidence in the government. And if we think of military credits as a matter of confidence, the issue clarifies. Now, of course, the military can do good. Uh, think of disaster relief at one end, you know, um, handing out food to the starving. You know, it's cool, you know. Think about liberating Belson at the other. Yeah, I'm glad Belson is liberated. Um but military affairs are also of necessity veiled in a great deal of, se of secrecy. Necessarily so, a surprise and deception is a strategic and tactical resource. As a matter of principle, socialists can never trust the class state, configured as it is by oligarchy and even the most democratic arrangements we come across, and which will spend money and resources without democratic oversight, because that's what the military budget requires. I'm going to skip over a second last paragraph, but think about the good war. You know, um, Second World War involved um, a the state they knew about death camps, but didn't bomb them because that would give away um, intelligence. A um, they knew three million people are starving in Bengal, but they let it happen because otherwise it it make tricky the supply of armies and the, uh, the supply of armies in the specific arena. They authorized area bombing, knowing that was bombing civilians. They gave support to the American uh, development of the atom bomb. They nearly went to war with the Soviet Union in 1940, um, and not quite so nearly, but they contemplated it in 1945. The point here is not that wars can be fought decorously. Often they cannot. But rather, socialists should always th see themselves as a systemic opposition, which will never trust in a government um a uh, which they are which they are uh, uh, of which they are outside um of a only a majority socialist proletarian government can be trusted and this applies more than anything to the military budget which of necessity is covered by a veil of secrecy so it's really very straightforward for socialists not a man not a bullet for this class society that's me finished.